everybody. How you doing? Thanks for joining us. I'm with uh, my friend, Dr. Scott Blumenthal, all the way up from Dallas, Texas. Just got in. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here. Great. See, pe people are flying from all over the country, all over the world to be on this show. They've heard about it. you got to sign up. you got to get when it's hot. Well, well I, I appreciate it. You, you uh, did a guest appearance on ours in Dallas on the radio. That's right. That was a lot of fun. Usually, we only run into each other if we're in Germany. That's where we typically hang out. The, uh, and we've had some good times uh, doing artificial disc replacements and courses and everything in Germany where... A lot of it starts. So our topic tonight is artificial disc replacement in the lumbar spine compared to fusion. We're going to do a pro and con. And, uh, you know, I'm doing the fusion because I'm the old conservative surgeon who really does what's best for patients. He's kind of a maverick. He really likes to push the envelope. So he's doing the artificial disc replacement tonight. Well, you could, you could put it that way. But, uh, <laughs> but we, we've got some pretty good data. But at the end of the day, we're not really that far apart because the, the fusion that you do is anterior fusion. And that philosophically, there's not, not that much of a difference. Yeah. I mean, the anterior column is where you can get the most correction, the most complete removal of the disc, the best implant, and the best, frankly, the best decompression of nerve tissue as well. Yeah. So, you know, you're talking about preserving motion versus effusion, and it's individualized. And yeah. some patients are better suited for one or the other. Yeah. And your background, you're the director of uh, Artificial Disc Replacements, Motion Preservation at TBI, which is a huge center in Dallas for anybody who doesn't know. Yeah, we, we've, yeah. Been, we've been very fortunate. We, we started the FDA studies almost 20 years ago. Yeah. And we've been doing it longer than anybody in the U.S., and we've got a, a database now over 3,000 patients. Yeah. My dad was part of both those studies, actually, the Charité and the ProDisc. The absolutely, absolutely, yeah. 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 The, uh, and how, many, uh, how big is your center in Dallas? So there's 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 three of us yeah. um, that have been doing this and continue to do you know fairly high volume yeah. where appropriate obviously yeah um, you know Rick Iyer and, and uh, Jack Ziegler yeah and the three of us started this little subclinic within TBI about I don't know five ten years ago yeah and while we specifically tend to be a referral center for disc replacement. We still do a lot of the anterior inner body yeah. fusions when, when it's appropriate. Yeah. So it, it's more of an anterior column kind of you know philosophy, which I yeah. you know you kind of agree with. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The um, so what are some of the indications? What's your ideal candidate for an artificial disc replacement? So it's interesting. So when we started out, it was the purely axial back pain discogenic type patient. Yeah, and. You know, those are, are difficult to, to pick out the good candidates because really you're only dealing with one or two levels max. Yeah. We found later, and, and, and you know this, is that there's a certain percentage of patients that herniate a disc. You do your microdiscectomy, their leg pain goes away. Right. And five to maybe 15% will either have persistent back pain or come back with back pain from disc space collapse, either just the collapse itself, yeah. or it repinches the nerve in the foramen, right. and those patients are the, they're actually the best patients. So you think for exiting nerve foraminal stenosis is well treated with an artificial disc replacement? You know, when we started out, we didn't think so. Yeah. And when we actually analyzed our data, yeah, those are the best patients. Those are, are they the really best patients? And that's pretty counterintuitive, or at least it's counter general spine knowledge. You know, the nerves, it's either the traversing nerve in the canal, which is the most common one that gets affected, the, nerve, the exiting nerve coming out of the frame, and if everything's collapsed down, that's the most sensitive part of the nerve, and they hurt the most. And typically, we think a fusion treats that most effectively because you jack it back open, stop the motion, and treats it. But you're saying you can get some distraction. Do you get some distraction with the artificial disc? And you, st you can still preserve motion, and, and still you don't have residual irritability of the nerve. The key thing is, like you said, is jack it up. Yeah. And you can jack up the disc space equally as well with a fusion as with a disc replacement. And the preservation of motion doesn't seem to irritate the nerve as long as the nerve is decompressed in the foramen. Well, and one of the other concepts, too, is a scarred nerve. If you've already had surgery, a discectomy, where you take a disc herniation out, typically under a microscope, and that's when we're doing all the professional athletes that go back and play sports. But the thinking is that after that surgery, the nerve may be scarred to the back of the disc, and if you're still having pain or symptoms, that a fusion treats it because it stops the motion and stops any residual irritability of the nerve if it's scarred to the back of the disc. But you're saying your results have actually shown that artificial disc replacements that preserve motion do really well in these after-discectomy types of patients. Yeah, it makes you rethink 
whether it's the, the scarring of the nerve that's yeah. causing the residual leg pain. Because the first FDA study was a comparison between an anterior inner body fusion and an artificial disc. Yeah. And we actually thought, we, we were concerned that these post-discectomy patients wouldn't do as well for that reason. Right. And it turns out they did just as well. So I, I think it's the making room for the nerve and you know, maybe the, the motion actually prevents the nerve from scarring down or unscars it at some point. I, I, I just don't know. Right. All I do know is it works just as well. And what about when you're do technically when you're doing an artificial disc replacement in one of those post discectomy patients, how aggressive are you with the annular release and if there's any bulge to the disc, trying to take the, all of the disc and the scar tissue out and dissect it off the nerve because the nerve is behind you and you can't always see it real well. How aggressive are you about doing that? Or how aggressive do you think you need to be? Well, the when we first started, the posterior release, releasing yeah. the annulus was done routinely. Yeah. Then we started to get a little bit more bold right. for recurrent disc herniations. And much like you can take out a disc herniation from the front of the cervical, we do it all the time. Yeah. We found that with good exposure, we can do the same thing lumbar. Yeah. So you wear loops or use a microscope or I wear loops. Loops. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. And those are magnifying loops that blow it up so you can see better with a headlight. Yeah. 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 Loops in the headlight seems yeah. to work well. Yeah. Um, and, and we've actually, and I don't know, philosophically with anterior fusions, yeah. because if you've got the right setup, access surgeons, et cetera, yeah. we're being a little bit more aggressive with even first time re-herniations of yeah. going in the front and either doing a disc replacement or an anterior fusion. Yeah. Certainly two, two re-herniations is pretty standard to go do something more reconstructive. Right. But you know, it's, it's an easier way to get a recurrent disc out with less scar doing it from the front than going in the back again. Yeah, and, and what about what about the small central disc herniations? A lot of times in athletes, you'll see the small central disc herniations and back pain, and not a lot of radicular nerve component. You know, where you kind of don't you don't want to do a discectomy necessarily because they're not having nerve pain. You don't think the surgery is going to help a whole lot, but they've struggled. They've done the rehab. They've done the back doctor app for a year. They're not getting any better, and they're still struggling. Um, do you, would you lean towards doing a discectomy to potentially get a subligamentous herniation out, let the annulus heal to treat their back pain, or would you jump straight into an artificial disc? I've tended in the younger patients, yeah. and obviously these athletes, high-level athletes, are going to be younger, of doing, giving them a chance for a discectomy, rehabbing the heck out of them, yeah. and seeing how they do. Um, you know, we don't have the pro athlete experience like you guys do, but in our, our younger patients, I'm not I'm not impressed with those results, yeah. but I hate to do a big reconstructive procedure like an artificial disc or an anterior fusion in someone real young. Yeah. In the FDA studies, the youngest we did was was 18, yeah. and, and that's pretty young. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you raised that point because one of the things people think of is, can I have an artificial disc? They'll come at us and say, can I have an artificial disc? Because they're thinking it's minimally invasive, it's motion preservation, it's just a little kind of a tune-up. And I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the context that an artificial disc is still a reconstructive surgery, like a fusion. Mm -hmm. You're still taking the disc out and putting an implant with metal in that there's no going back from. No. Um, it's, you know, it's much like you know, an athlete's knee. You're, you're not going to do a total knee replacement you know, on a 30-year-old athlete when yeah. they've got a little bit of you know, arthritic or meniscal damage. You, you, try to, you try to buy some time before and hopefully maybe even avoid a, a big surgery in the future. Yeah, what cases do you think are not amenable to an artificial disc? And to be frank, what are some of the cases you kind of regretted putting one in and you thought, oh, if we had noticed that or looked at that, we might not have done it? So certainly in, in the condition um, called spondylolisthesis, yeah. where you've got um, a non-union of an old stress fracture in the back of the spine, that's an absolute contraindication. Yeah. It's not always easy to see on the x-ray, so we've done preoperative CT scans on all of our patients because yeah. if you look back on the original cohort, there are some that were missed and right. had to be revised to a fusion. Mm -hmm. You can't fix deformity. They got scoliosis. You don't, you don't treat scoliosis with an artificial disc. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I really think twice about more than, more than two levels. I know that in Europe, outside the U.S., they're more aggressive with three and four level kind yeah. of stuff, but the patients that we see I, I pretty much talk them out at three levels. Yeah. The, uh, and so ultimate, and do you have a preference for L4-5 or L5-S1? You know, 
studies have shown, there's some studies that show 5.1 does better, some studies show that 4.5 does better. Um, I think at 5.1, it's not as mobile a disc anyway. Yeah. Um, certainly, you know, on, on an athlete, if, if they wanted to return to play, a solid fusion would make them feel a lot better. Right. Um, four or five, no brainer. I, I'd want to preserve the motion. Disc right. replacement. And what uh, sports do you think are safe to go back with a single level artificial disc replacement? We'll say at L4, L5. Well, let's start with what sports do you think are not safe to go back? Well, I'll tell you what's, what's not tested. Yeah. I don't know any um, pro football players in the U.S that have a lumbar artificial disc that went back and played. Right. I do know um, rugby and soccer players outside the U.S. that have had both cervical and lumbar disc replacements yep. and have gone back to play. Uh, pro golfer, for sure. Uh -huh. um, there are golfers on the PGA Tour with both lumbar and cervical yeah. disc replacements. Um, How would you feel about baseball? So I, I would probably be comfortable with that. And, and the yeah. only reason I say that is that we've had patients who unfortunately have had high collision motor vehicle accidents and things like that right. after lumbar disc replacement. Right. I, and I can remember one where he showed me the x-ray of his hip being dislocated dramatically yeah. right next to an L5-S1 disc replacement, yeah. which was perfect. Yeah, that's an so. excellent point, is that there are a lot of people playing pickup basketball and playing pickup soccer, which is not professional level, but it also means they're 40, 50-year-olds, not in good shape, crashing into each other, maybe mm -hmm. more violent than the professional sport. Yeah. And, and they've tolerated it. And they've tolerated it. You yeah. know, and, and it's fortunate that we've got colleagues outside the U.S. that, that don't seem to mind pushing the envelope. I, yeah. I was surprised to hear about rugby players with cervical disc replacements, but yeah. there you have it. The, uh, do you feel, which one do you, I mean, I know it's, it's multifactorial, but, but which one would you be more comfortable with somebody going back with a lumbar artificial disc or a cervical in a uh, contact or a collision type of sport? I think collision and contact would be different. Uh -huh. uh, a collision sport like a linebacker in football, yeah. Yeah. I, I would be real hard pressed to send someone back with the disc replacement just because do you want to be the first one? Right. Um, and the first one to fail. Right. The, right. Whereas the, it, now, whereas now, now, which one do you feel better about, the cervical or the lumbar? Probably lumbar. Yeah, uh, really? Yeah, I, I don't, because I don't, it's not your spinal cord? Right. I, well, that, and, and it's yeah. it's so protected, and you've got such a muscular envelope, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't think twice about, you know, a lineman with a lumbar artificial disc. It's not going to fall apart. Yeah. Whether or not, you know, he'll have continued back pain or not because of the motion in the facet joints and stuff, that's that's a whole other yeah. issue. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I was thinking lumbar, because of the impact the lumbar spine takes, I'd be more weary of a lumbar artificial disc, but um, but the cervical ones, just what I mentioned, is the cervical ones, if they dislocate or, or go backwards, you, it's your spinal cord, you can end up paralyzed, whereas your lumbar spine, it's not likely it's going to be a catastrophic injury. It's not your spinal cord, you're not going to be paralyzed. It may just kind of fall apart and wear out and, and have to be changed to a fusion is maybe the worst case scenario. Correct. Yeah, that sounds a lot safer. So tell us about the outcomes. Uh, so the original outcomes with server, with lumbar fusion and artificial disc replacement, it was basically that patients got back to work faster and that their patient satisfaction was greater, but a lot of the clinical outcomes were about the same. Correct. And now that we've got longer-term follow-up, yeah. the... Like you said, at two years, you don't tell the patient they don't know what they have. They do equally well. Right. The problem is down the road, and there's something, as you know, called fusion disease, which, which translates into transition disease, which is by eliminating motion at one segment, you transition the stress to the next one, and there's reasonably good evidence that it accelerates the deterioration next to a fusion. Right. So the long-term studies on disc replacement have shown anywhere from about a third to a fourth, less of a need for f for further surgery. Right. So the reoperation rate, both actually, frankly, at the level as well as at the next level, is less with disc replacement than with fusion. Right. I just saw a paper recently that Jack Ziegler put on. You might have been on it too. I did. Uh, that showed artificial discs had less of a reoperation rate at adjacent levels at five years, but at ten years, that this the statistical significance went away. Is that true? The uh... yeah. The, what happened was the, as you know, um, it's 
the follow-up became less and less, so there were less numbers. So yeah, you're so right. you lost statistical significance, but there was still somewhat of a difference. Yeah, and and in the cervical spine, it's yeah. even more clear yeah. that there's less reoperations with with really good follow-up of the long-term studies there. The lumbar just has less numbers. And Jack's uh, paper said 33% got reoperated on adjacent level at 10 years of the lumbar artificial discs which I thought was an interesting number because all the numbers I remember from old fusions where they were done mainly just posterior where you didn't get lordotic correction. So you're fusing people in flat back, which makes their torso come forward, puts more stress on the adjacent discs, is gonna have a higher incidence of adjacent level problems. When we fuse people from the front, we correct the lordosis, which decreases the stress. But the old style fusions had around a 25 to 30% reoperation rate up to 10 years and half of those were decompressions. That was, that's always the data that I've always had in mind, and then I was kind of surprised that Jack's paper said 33% after an artificial disc at 10 years, which reminds me of the old lumbar numbers. Well, and, and, and remember, yeah. much like if someone has a stent for you know, cardiac disease, yeah. they might have another stent in 10 years. You, you, haven't, you, you don't arrest time, father yeah. time. Yeah. Lumbar degenerative disease is a progressive, it's not really a disease, it's just, it's just what my old professor used to call gray hair and wrinkles of the spine. Yeah. And it progresses. And you know, patients say, well, does this, you know, is this going to protect my next level forever? Well, no, you're going to if you live long enough, you're eventually going to get a degenerative disc above whether it's a fusion or an artificial disc. Yeah. It just appears to be less rapid with the artificial disc. What's the revision strategy? For if something's not working well, or if you've got a vertebral fracture, you know, some types of issues. What, t tell us about some of the catastrophes and how to deal with them. Well, so we looked at our first 1,700 yeah. disc replacements, and we had to revise 17. Yeah. So it's 1%. We've obviously done more since then. So the revision rate's less than 1% of having to go back in the front. Yeah. Much like if you do an anterior fusion and you have a non-union, what do you do? You just go in the back and do a posterior fusion with screws. Right. Most of the revisions that we've had to do with lumbar disc replacement have been simply posterior fixation with the fusion and screws and not have to go back in the front. But the problem is if it's moving, we, the, so the two that we went in the back and put in screws in the back, they didn't fuse mm -hmm. because the artificial disc was still moving. And so have you had any experience with that? If, if the, you get loosening of the screws and it doesn't fuse? No, all the ones yeah. that we've, we've done oh, posteriorly, have, knock on wood, um, have healed. Because most of these failed discs end up subsiding into the bone and they kind of yeah. end up stiffening the whole segment anyway. And that may relate somewhat to the indications for the surgery. And, the, and part of the problem with the surgery, you're just the complicating factor, is that you're operating on mainly discogenic back pain. And so maybe you'll help 80 to 90 percent of people, which is good results. That's that count. We count that as a successful surgery, but that's 10 to 20 percent of people that are still having residual back pain, and that's where it comes to the patient and the doctor and the and the doctor's sense of if you get studies and everything looks okay, do you tell the patient, look, you fell into the 10 to 20 percent, you still have back pain? If everything looks okay on the X-rays, if it hasn't collapsed down, you don't see real biomechanical problems. If it looks like it's working normal. At what point do you tell patients you should just live with it, or should we try and change you to a fusion? Well, it's interesting. When the thought process when it first came out was exactly that. Well, guess you weren't a good disc replacement candidate. We'll do a fusion. Yeah. So we started to fuse some of these people. Yeah. And they didn't get better. Right. So then we start asking all the people around the world. Maybe they had a non-union. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. we asked people, you know, around the world who've been doing at that point disc replacement longer than we have. Yeah. And they said, no, if it's just for pain, yeah. they just weren't a great candidate, whether it would be a fusion or a disc replacement. Because with fusion, 10 to 20% of patients don't get it. And, you know, some of the perception that I hear from patients are, oh, Europe, they got all the latest and greatest and better stuff than we have here, and they're really, you know, and it's better. What's your impression of European medicine? Is it better than what we have in America? There are technically some excellent, excellent surgeons outside the U.S. Yeah. Your impression that that they say yes to almost everybody yeah. is true and and what they're what they're trying to to do to, to kind of lasso patients from the US is say, yeah. well we can do this new disc that's better than what they have in the US. Yeah. Well there's no there's nothing in the there's no research that yeah. says it's better except right. anecdotally they say it's better. Well and it's also new. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's better. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Well, that's great. I think we pretty much covered the topic. you have anything else you want to add? No, uh, this was fun. I really, yeah. 
I really appreciate it. It's yeah, thanks be, for coming. It's good to be in L.A. Now we can go have our Jameson. There we go. <laughs> I'm in. All, All right, right, buddy. Thanks for coming. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us.